Hello everyone, this is Dr. Muti coming to you live from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada, where I am here with Dr. Anelli for the National Entomological Society of America conference. So because I am here and not in Columbus, you have the pleasure slash torture of listening to a pre-recorded lecture. Um, so today's topic is on plant-insect interactions, the good, the bad, and the unexpected. And let's see what we're going to talk about. So first we're going to talk about the coevolution between insects and plants. And then we're going to talk about the positive, some of the positive relationships between insects and plants. Namely, um, the way that insects are pollinators of plants and um, also the role that they play in seed dispersal. Then we're going to switch gears um, talking about, you know, because we've been talking a lot about positive ecosystem services that insects are providing both as um, decomposers in, uh, in soils and all of the roles that they play in aquatic environments that you heard from last week from Dr. Dr. Chortis, um, as well as the role that they play as predators and parasitoids. And then, and then, you know, today more positive stuff, pollinators and seed dispersals, but then we're going to talk about some of the negative roles that insects play on plants. Um, namely, the um, roles that they play in phytophagy and in plant dispenses. So I know that listening to me talk at you for 50 minutes without a break in a recorded lecture is really borderline torture. So we're not going to do that. Instead, we're gonna, I'm going to be stopping at, at points throughout here. So there's going to be a series of videos. Um, so for the first chunk or section, we'll talk a little bit about the coevolution of, of, of between insects and plants. And then we'll stop and I'll start the second video. So without further ado, here we go. So plants and insects have been co-evolving with each other for over 300 million years. And the rise of the angiosperms and the rise of pollinators closely close by, coincide with one another. So what are angiosperms? Yes, I'm not here with you. <laughs> so you don't have the benefit of answering and raising your hand. But every time I do ask you a question here, I do want you to maybe pause the recording and just stop and think about it and see if you can answer. So if you've done your reading like you should have, you would rem remember that angiosperms are the flowering plants. And, um, you know, the flowering plants are beautiful. We love flowers on plants. Um, and they um, are probably so beautiful because of insects, because of the role that insects play, or that flowers play in attracting insects and getting them to pollinate for them. Um, however, it's difficult to demonstrate that coevolution has occurred because you can only demonstrate a correlation between two taxa that suggest coevolution. None of us were around 300 million years ago when the first angiosperms and the first pollinating insects were around. So all we can see is the correlation. We can't infer causation, which would be coevolution. So um, an example of something that appears to be coevolutionary is if a flower has a very deep tube that um, you know, would provide an insect access to nectar. And if only a particular species of moth would have a proboscis that would be long enough to access that, that, that nectar source. Okay, so there are a couple of different types of coevolution, again, that you've encountered during your reading. Um, one is guild coevolution, which is the reciprocal evolutionary change among groups rather than pairs of species. So a great example of this is insect pollinators and flowers. So we see, um, you know, the rise of angiosperms, the flowering plants, coinciding, coinciding with the rise and diversification of a lot of the bees, the hymenopterans, as well as a lot of the lepidopterans, the butterflies and moths, and a lot of the dipterans as well. Okay. And this is in contrast to pairwise coevolution, which is the evolution of a trait in one species as a response to a trait in another species, which is in turn evolved in response to the trait of the first species. So it's kind of this going around and around in circles. So in some cases, you know, the example that we just talked about of the flower with a really long tube and the mouth with a really long proboscis would be a great um, example of pairwise coevolution. Um, but it, another instance could be an evolutionary arms race, which um, an example of this is if an insect prefers to eat a certain plant, then the plant would produce a toxic chemical to stop the insect from eating it, because clearly that's not good for the plant. 
and then the insect would then evolve to detoxify that plant toxin. So in turn, that plant might develop a new toxin or higher doses of it or something like that. So this is sometimes called as the Red Queen Hypothesis um, from Alice in Wonderland. That's what this picture is doing here. And you know that um, the Red Queen has to run and run and run and run faster and faster and faster just to stay in place. So that's kind of the idea of this evolutionary arms race. You have to keep on one-upping and co-evolving with your, um, your enemy <laughs> so that you're able to, to stay in the same place, that you're able to coexist. Okay. All right, so that concludes the first chunk. Well done.